a BRA 600, which is a way we'll give our webinars. It's modeling and rating propane refrigeration. And so sort of the idea for this webinar is I was thinking about my home air conditioner and I just always sort of wondered, well, how much do the outside conditions, how much the ambient conditions really affect the power consumption on my, on my home AC unit? You can see the electricity bill would swing maybe $50, $75 in the summer. Some of you might have it a whole lot worse. Some of you might have more efficient house than me and a little bit better than that. And I'm just sort of curious how much of that is due to the air conditioning load. So we have two things going on. One is just the amount of heat that gets into the house goes up in the summer, but also the uh, air conditioning unit itself, it is somewhat affected by, or it is affected by ambient conditions. And so I just thought, well, I'll, I'll model that. My, we've got Promax here on my desktop. I can make some assumptions and model that and see how much of an effect that has. So, so we're talking about 50 to $75 a, day, a month or so on a home AC unit. Uh, if you look at some, something industrial though, we're now talking about dollars in the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands possibly in a month. And so a little bit more consequential. And so a lot of those units are propane refrigeration rather than the, the Freon you have in your home unit, but the principles are all the same. I mean, you could easily, conditions might need to change a little bit if you change refrigerants, but the overall process is just about the same. And so we're gonna essentially step through how to model propane refrigeration and then how to incorporate some, some real equipment data such as compressor performance curves and heat exchanger design data to get an accurate model of how your real equipment will perform under different conditions. A basic outline for today's class is we will start with just refrigeration basics, just sort of the basic uh, simple refrigeration process. We'll talk about just a, a simple loop and then a loop with an economizer. Uh, we'll build just a simple model with some fixed approach temperatures around around the exchangers just to get, get our feet wet on how to model these refrigeration units. And then we'll expand that model to incorporate the compressor performance curves and also the heat exchanger data sheets. And we'll, we'll do that in two ways. These will be variable speed compressors. And so what we'll do is we'll fix the compressor speed of, this will be for an economizer, so it'll have two compressors. So we'll, we'll fix the compressor speed for those two. And then we will see how the performance changes based on ambient conditions or the duty uh, duty requirements for the for the system. And then we'll switch to we'll let the uh, let the compressor speed float, and we'll adjust the economizer pressure to find the optimum economizer pressure that that minimizes the overall compression power. And so I. Two models of that, and I think we'll be able to pretty easily get through that in about an hour and a half. And so, what we have shown here is a simple refrigeration loop, just no economizer. Essentially, we have one evaporator or uh, one compressor, excuse me. And let's just talk through this loop. And so, it is a loop, so really you, you can start anywhere in it, but I'll just keep everything simple. We'll just start here in, in stream one. Stream one is essentially, in this portion of the process, we have a, a cold, low pressure, two phase mixture of our refrigerant. And so this will be the, the coldest point in our system. And then we have an evaporator as the next piece of equipment that goes through. And so an evaporator would be the, the piece of equipment that's connected to your process. So this would be the, the chiller, for instance, your propane chiller loop. So, and so what we're going to do is we have, as I mentioned before, we have this cold two-phase mixture. And what we're going to do is evaporate uh, the liquid portion of that mixture, turn it all into a vapor. And when we do that, when we evaporate the liquid portion of the refrigerant, we will be, that takes heat, and that heat will be supplied by our process. And in so doing, we'll be cooling down our process or we'll be removing heat from our process at a minimum. So going through the evaporator, we have our cold two-phase mixture coming in, so at low, low pressure coming out on the other side, that piece of equipment. We now have 
it's still typically a cold mixture, but all the liquid has been evaporated. So all of the liquid refrigerant is now a vapor. And so down here we have a cold, low pressure refrigerant vapor. And essentially we want to be able to, we need to regenerate that cold two phase mixture that we have over here in stream one. So we have a number of pieces of equipment to do that. First thing we need to do is boost the compress boost the pressure on the vapor refrigerant. And we go through the compressor, we will boost the pressure up, and then the refrigerant will superheat. So it'll we'll raise the pressure and also superheat it. We'd like to get back to a liquid refrigerant. And we had a, at least a partial liquid refrigerant over here. And so the next step is we take our now hot high pressure gas or, or vapor refrigerant and we send it through a condenser where we remove energy from the gas or from the refrigerant. And in so doing, we first remove that superheat and then we condense, condense our vapor refrigerant into a liquid. So at this point, we have a warm, all liquid refrigerant coming out of the condenser. And so the next step after, to get back to our starting point, essentially if we take a, a warm all liquid refrigerant and we drop the pressure through an expansion valve we have here we will well the temperature will go down and part of our liquid refrigerant will evaporate and so with that we are back down to our two-phase mixture here our cold two-phase low pressure mixture and the process can repeat and so we can talk about that on a uh, a little bit more rigorously and on an enthalpy pressure diagram. And so we can take this process and plot it on this enthalpy pressure diagram here. So this would be for a propane refrigeration loop. We got that listed here. And so try to translate our Promax model here over to this plot. And Essentially, the streams between the Promax blocks represent the vertices or the corners on our plot. And then the lines on the diagram represent the, the, pro, the unit operation or the, the process that are the blocks here in the Promax model. And so point one corresponds to this point down here in the corner, and then point two, point three, and then point four. So a little bit more about this diagram. So this is the phase envelope for propane. So over here on the left, we have the 0% vapor line. So that would be also the, the bubble point line. And then over here on the right, we have the 100% vapor line or the, the dew point line. And then we have isotherms plotted here on the on the plot, and you can see as the isotherms come down inside the phase envelope, since this is a pure component, essentially at, at a constant pressure, we will go from all liquid to all vapor at constant pressure at a constant temperature. So you can see the 160 degree line is parallel with the constant pressure line, or is a, on a constant pressure line. So. This is due to the fact that we do have a pure refrigerant. So if you have a mixed refrigerant, obviously you'll cross the ice, you'll be crossing some isotherms as you go from all liquid to all vapor at, at constant pressure. And you can see you have different isotherms. So over here we got the 80 degree isotherm. You get down here to about the minus 35 degrees down here at the bottom. So let's say we're at minus 35 degrees. And it's about 20 PSIA, if I remember correct. So it's above atmospheric pressure, but not too much above atmospheric pressure here. And so we're here at point one. Uh, as we pull in energy into the gas or into the refrigerant in the evaporator, essentially we remain at, the, at a constant temperature going across the plot until we have evaporated all of the, the liquid portion of the two-phase mixture. And so we end up over here in this corner, which coincides with 
uh, stream two here in our model. So coming out of stream two, we compress the gas up to a higher pressure. And you can see as we do that, we cross a number of these isotherm lines. And so we end up with a temperature on this plot that's probably around 180 degrees Fahrenheit at roughly 250 PSIA. I'm just sort of eyeballing these temperatures. I could be off a little bit. Okay, I did have a question from Glenn. Uh, will Promax generate a pressure enthalpy graph with isotherms for a refrigerant mixture that is not pure propane? You can use Promax to generate this graph. It doesn't do it automatically though. All the data is there, but essentially have to had to overlay the isotherms on top of the pressure enthalpy diagram. It's not that hard to do, but it's not a one-step process. But if that is something you're interested in doing, we probably should. If we haven't automated that already, we probably should. So that's something we could work one-on-one -on -one with you if that's something you'd be interested in. Okay, so back to this, back to the plot. So we go from our compressor, we go from a low pressure up to a high pressure, and we raise the temperature significantly. So when we're out in this region, we're in the superheated region. And so the next, so now we're up here, essentially the conditions in stream three. And then we can, as we go through the condenser, first we will desuperheat. Since you can see we are crossing some isotherms, so we're getting cooler. And then we will condense this pure refrigerant at constant pressure or at constant temperature and constant pressure until we end up back over here on the, the bubble point line or the 0% vapor line. So, and so now we have our warm, in this case is about 120 degrees, all liquid refrigerant, uh, but we need to get the refrigerant cold again so that it's colder than our process fluid. And by, luckily for us, uh, this refrigerant does have a positive Joule-Thompson coefficient, which means as we go across the valve and drop the pressure, the temperature will drop. And so, so we're back at our starting point. And you, but you can see as we do that, we start to move into the two-phase region. And it looks like at this point, we're about 50% vapor. So, so half liquid, half vapor refrigerant. And since we're, since this is a pure refrigerant and we are essentially boiling the liquid refrigerant at constant temperature here, Essentially, the, the only portion of the refrigerant that's doing any, that's absorbing any heat for us is the liquid portion. So the vapor is at constant temperature. If the temperature doesn't go up, there's no sensible heating of the vapor. And so essentially, it's just a latent heat effect here in the evaporator. Obviously, if you did have a two-phase mixture, you could have both sense, it, it wouldn't be occurring at constant temperature here in the evaporator, and you would have some simultaneous sensible heating and latent heat. For the most part though, the latent heat is still gonna be the predominant form of heat pickup in the evaporator. And so if we look at the, the enthalpy change for the refrigerant on this diagram, we can see that the cooling, which is essentially the amount of energy that we pick up from the, the process, enthalpy change across the evaporator, and then the enthalpy change across the compressor is just our compressor work. And you can see that the amount of energy that we have to reject in the condenser is just the sum of these two. And so what happens as what sets this max, this temperature in the condenser is essentially the temperature at which we can reject heat. So for instance, if it's 100 degrees outside or, and we can we say we can get a 20 degree approach in our air cooler, then that means that our we're going to condense our refrigerant at roughly 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And so this 120 degrees Fahrenheit, essentially the, the dew point pressure or, or the bubble point pressure and the dew point pressure, which are the same, is going to be the pressure at which we, we condense the refrigerant. And you can see if we could lower that temperature, so instead of condensing at 120 degrees, we instead condense it maybe 100 degrees, we would, ascend, we would then be condensing down at a lower pressure here. And the compressor work, instead of extending all the way over to here, would stop here roughly at this intersection with the 160 degree curve. 
And so by lowering this condenser pressure, we would lower the compressor work, which mechanically makes sense. You're not having to push the push against this high pressure. And thermodynamically, essentially what it's going to do is move this compressor work line to the left. And so we end up with less compressor work here. Another benefit of operating at a lower pressure is when we condense the gas down to 100 instead of to 120, for instance, we will now end up at roughly this point on the plot. And so when we drop down to our low evaporator pressure, we're gonna have a larger portion of liquid in our refrigerant, which means there is more liquid to, to boil going through the evaporator or a larger fraction of liquid to boil going through the evaporator, which means for the total amount of refrigerant that's in circulation, a larger fraction actually is there to pick up energy in the evaporator. And so the total amount of refrigerant that we have to circulate goes down when our condenser pressure goes down. And so we can decrease the amount of, of uh, refrigerant in circulation, then we can reduce the total power requirement for the system. So for one thing we have, we're not pushing against this higher pressure in the compressor and the number of moles going through the compressor goes down. So you really have a, a double effect there from the lower from the lower condenser pressure. And if we look at the compressor compression power as a function of condenser temperature, we can see that as the condenser temperature goes from 80 degrees up to 120 degrees, that the power requirements go up. And we can also see that as the evaporator temperature goes down, for instance, if we only need to cool down to 30 degrees, it's going to take considerably less energy than if we need to cool down to minus 40 degrees. So it's almost a, that's what, 70 versus 210. It's almost a threefold increase in power. And if we look at the plot, we can understand why that is. So essentially, if we can move this bottom green line up, since we're absorbing heat at a, at a higher temperature, then essentially we, instead of having to go all the way down here across our expansion valve, we only have to go down to this point. And what, what this allows us to do is start with a larger liquid fraction. And also as we evaporate, we'll come across further on the, we'll end up closer to our final pressure over here. So the compression work goes down as our evaporator temperature goes down also. So, so we're not having to push us, not having to push us up, up as such a large hill over here with the compressor. And we also are extracting more energy from our process for each pound mole of refrigerant that goes through the system because a larger fraction of the total pound moles are a liquid going into the evaporator. And so what we'll see is we can increase the, we can decrease the condenser temperature and increase the evaporator temperature, or essentially bring the condenser and the evaporator temperature closer together, we will see a decrease in power through the system. And so the a question sometimes comes up, well, why do we use propane? And if we look at the, uh, the pressure temperature diagram for four different possible refrigerants. So we, we use propane a lot, but who says we couldn't use ethane? Sometimes that is, ethane is used or ethylene, for instance. Or we could also be using isobutane or normal butane. And so what we show here on a plot is the pressure temperature diagram for ethane, propane, and then isobutane and normal butane. So essentially, since these are pure components, uh, the on a pressure temperature diagram that phase envelope collapses to a straight line. So you can see this is essentially the boiling pressure for any given temperature for ethane. So our our condenser temperature is largely set by our or is set by our outdoor conditions. Uh, most of the time, the the condenser is an air cooled exchanger. 
or we would like to use an air cooled exchanger if possible. And the conditions air coolers will get you down to are about 80 to about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Down here in Texas, it's probably closer to the 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you can see if we tried to use ethane as a refrigerant, essentially we would be condensing the ethane. At, the ethane would be getting to pretty high pressures in, we would need to get it pretty high pressures so that we would be able to condense it in the condenser. So it would be upwards of 650 or close to 650 PSIA here to try to condense the ethane at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see if you go further up this plot, essentially the ethane line stops because we've reached the critical point. And so at this point, you, there's no, you can't condense the ethane. It's all super critical at this point. And so for typical conditions where you're trying to cool with an air cooler, ethane is ruled out mainly due to the high pressures and the, the critical point of the ethane, which is way up here. If we look down here on the other side, you can see with propane, Essentially, we're condensing in a range somewhere from about 150 up to about 250 PSI. So fairly high pressure, but, but manageable. It would probably be beneficial, though, if we could condense at even lower pressure. We could have lower, uh, lower pressure requirements in our equipment. And so that would lead us to possibly use some of the butanes. So see that isobutane, you, know, you can condense it even at 120 degrees at at 100 PSIA, so, and the normal butane even lower, but for, and so a butane might be a good refrigerant, but let's say we need to get down, in our evaporator, we need to get down to about minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see we don't even take the propane or the butane lines over that far. And essentially what happens is we get down below about 10 degrees Fahrenheit for the isobutane and 30 degrees Fahrenheit for the normal butane, since we're getting below uh, atmospheric pressure. And so we want to avoid vacuum conditions with our refrigerant. And so that really sort of puts the bottom, puts the bottom end on using the butane as a refrigerant. So be a perfectly good refrigerant if you never need to get below about 40 degrees. But if you need to get down to the minus 20 to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, then propane just sort of fits the bill through all of these cases. And so for typical operating range for a propane condenser, is we'll have the condenser in this 80 to 120 degree range, has pressure from about 150 up to 250 or 240, it shows here. And then the chiller, we down around, to get down to minus 40, where it, I forget the exact number, I think it's somewhere 20 PSIA or so. And, at higher temperatures, we'd be at higher chiller pressures. So our chiller or evaporator pressures here. So you can see, you need to get to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Chiller is operating at roughly 70 or 65 to 70 psia. So propane is just—it's just a convenient refrigerant. There's nothing really special about propane. As we showed before on that plot a few stages back, you can see that when the difference between the condenser temperature and the evaporator temperature gets large, then the power requirements go up considerably. And so what we can do to minimize that is to add an economizer to the system. So as I mentioned before, going through the evaporator, at least for the pure component, all that's doing any work for us is a liquid refrigerant. But we're producing a lot of vapor as we drop the pressure down to that final lowest pressure. What an economy, with an economizer, essentially what we do is we drop the pressure down to an intermediate pressure, remove whatever vapor has been produced at that point. And so that vapor, there's no point in dropping the temperature or dropping the pressure of the vapor we've already produced any further. So let's just remove it from the system and just recompress from that intermediate pressure. And then just take the liquid that's there at that intermediate pressure and then expand it down to the lowest pressure. So that gives us two things. We have an all or a larger liquid fraction going into the evaporator, but a low to lower overall mass flow to compress from the lowest pressure back up to the highest pressure in the system. And so since we have a compressor to take our lowest pressure refrigerant, boost it back up to that intermediate pressure we set in the economizer, and then we take all of our refrigerant after we mix it together and then boost it back up to the final condenser pressure. 
and you can save, depending on the condenser and evaporator temperatures, you can save 20 to 30% of the power by adding in an economizer. And we can look at this on the same pressure enthalpy diagram we had before. Still start here with bottom corner. Or the stream three represents this bottom corner here. You can see we're starting with a larger fraction of liquid at this point. Going into the evaporator and we're, we're still compressing up to that same 120 degrees, which was roughly 240 PSIA here. And we're dropping the pressure down to it looks like about 90 PSIA here. We will have produced a about 15% vapor, 30% vapor at this point. Let's remove that vapor at that intermediate pressure and then just take the liquid portion that's remaining and drop it down to that final lowest pressure. So we then compress in compressor one back up to this intermediate point. And you can see take the vapor from the economizer and the discharge from compressor one, mix them together and send all of that back to compressor two, where we compress up to the, the final condenser pressure. And so doing essentially what we're doing is just removing some material from, from having to be boosted from the, from the lowest pressure all the way back up to the highest pressure. And so the economizer is really beneficial when we have a large difference in temperature between the condenser and the evaporator, which is what is shown on this next plot. Our original plot, the lines without the dots, and then we have corresponding to that. So same 120 degree economy, 120 degree condenser temperature, um, but you can see the effect of the economizer here is to drop the power requirements from 360 or so down to about 230. So pretty significant, or 230, 270. So about a 25% reduction in power here. So, and this would be at the highest condenser temperature and coldest evaporator temperature. And you can see the, the difference goes down as the condenser temperature goes down. So you can see the difference between an 80 degree condenser with and without an economizer is much less than that 25% difference we saw between the 120 degree. And then as we get over here where the evaporator temperature gets closer to the condenser temperature, you can see the power savings becomes much less significant than it is when you have such a large difference here. So with that, let's now just step through how to build some models based on how to model a propane refrigeration unit. And so what we're going to model is a propane refrigeration loop with an economizer. So we'll, we'll sort of start with something a little bit more complex or a little bit complex. And so we'll just sort of step through how we would recommend modeling these units laid out a little bit differently than we had before. We got the this propane kettle here. That's our evaporator. It used to be on bottom now. It's up on top in the model. And now we have our condenser down at the bottom. So we essentially flip this model as compared to what we had before. And so what we've got in this model is going to be propane refrigeration. So that'll be one of our constraints. Um, and then we've got our process requirements up here. So we have 175 million standard cubic feet per day coming in at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And we are going to, we're cooling it down to minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like this process fluid is mainly, so our process fluid is sort of a, a simple natural gas mixture, mainly methane, nothing out of the ordinary here. Um, but by specifying the inlet and outlet, and we've got the inlet and outlet conditions, now essentially set the duty going into our evaporator here. So. So we have the duty specified in this system. And now we're gonna model the propane refrigeration loop that goes along with that. And so one thing, first step was determine the chiller duty. So we've done that. And then just to talk through this model, the thing what we, that we didn't have in the previous diagrams was this propagation terminal. So this propagation terminal can be found in the recycle stencil over here in Pro Promax. And so the propagation terminal is necessary because we've got this closed loop system here. And what Promax tries to do when I put in a, a temperature or a pressure or a composition is it tries to 
propagate that information as far around the loop as it can to keep you essentially from over specifying your system. And if it can't, if it doesn't know uh, the temperature pressure, but it knows that you've specified it upstream somehow uh, and through some transformations in the block, it should still be known down or it'll eventually be known down here. Promax will essentially turn off your ability to specify those variables in the remainder of the system. Uh, but when you have this closed loop, Promax is essentially going to if I set a composition here, for instance, Promax is going to take that composition and it's going to realize that I might not know the conditions here in the in the separator, but once I do, the composition coming out of the separator is going to be fixed. And so it will turn off your ability to specify the composition through all of these blocks and that'll work its way around to here. And it'll come back around and it'll try to take that composition spec and force it back into stream one. And then, then Promax is gonna issue a warning telling you that you're trying to propagate this composition into a stream where the composition is already specified. And so we don't want that to happen. So what we have is this propagation block that allows us the user to decide what variables get propagated across that. And if I double click on this propagation terminal, you can see right now the propagated variables, they're all turned off. So essentially if we have anything in stream 10, it's not going to be carried into stream one and then vice versa too, anything in stream one is not going to be carried backwards. And so we're going to decide in a little bit what we want to propagate again across this, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. But otherwise, these are just typical Promax valves and separators and heat exchanger blocks and such and compressors. And there's nothing really special here. So the recommended way for specifying this would be first to set the composition of our refrigerant in the stream leaving the propagation term. And that propagation terminal is typically set downstream or specified downstream, or is inserted in the loop downstream of the condenser. So what I'm gonna do to start with is specify my composition here in stream one. So if I double click on stream one, and just to keep it simple, I'm gonna put 100% propane here. We could very, very easily put in a, a propane mixture that was had a little bit of butane in it, a little bit of ethane in it, but just keep the model simple. We'll just keep it as all propane for now. Yes, we want that to be all propane. Next step is set the expansion valve outlet temperature. So this will be our expansion valve, our final expansion valve here. Let's call this expansion valve. And learn to spell it right too. And so typically, let's just say we want to design this with a five degree approach to our process fluid. That means here in stream five, you need to, our refrigerant needs to expand down to a point where it's minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So it should be five degrees colder than our process fluid. So I'll set that to be minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So that'll give us a five degree approach temperature here in this exchanger. So the next step is set the evaporator outlet temperature, outlet vapor fraction to 100%. So we're gonna have our minus 30 degree two phase mixture here, and we are going to expand it out. Essentially, we're going to evaporate it here in our propane kettle and come out as a saturated vapor. It could also specify some degree of superheating here, but for this simple model, we're just going to say it comes out as 100% vapor. So that's a way of telling Promax that it is a saturated vapor. And then we, something we always know is we want to set the condenser outlet vapor fraction to be 0%. So remember, when in the condenser, we're removing superheat, but on, and then we're essentially condensing all the vapor, but coming out of the condenser, we will have essentially a saturated liquid. So we set the mole fraction vapor in the condenser to 0%. And then we also set the condenser outlet temperature. So we see here that our air in the process, coming into the process or into our air cooler is at 110 or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's assume we can get a 10 degree approach so we can get our 
refrigerant down to 110 degrees. So it'll be 110 degrees saturated liquid coming out of the compressor. And when we do that, we see that that's going to give us a condenser pressure of 216 PSIA. So it's already starting to fill in some of the information around the loop for us. And that's because we propagated the composition around the loop. At this point, Promax knows that the composition here is 100% propane. And so in this propagation terminal, typically what we want to propagate across are the two variables that we know coming out of the condenser. So in this case, we know that the, essentially we have 110 degrees Fahrenheit and it is a saturated liquid. So in the propagation terminal, we will specify the temperature and the vapor fraction to be propagated across. And then we also know that when coming out of this low pressure compressor here, essentially to blend it with to blend the outlet of the low pressure compressor with the, the vapor coming off the economizer, these two pressures need to be the same. And so typically a good thing to do here is to set the, this pressure to be equal to stream three's pressure. So I'll do a, use a specifier to do that. So if I double click on stream seven, right click and create simple specifier. And this will be LP outlet. And I'm just going to set it equal to stream three's pressure. I just need to find stream three. And then find its pressure. And give it the same name. Okay. You see you're starting to get some pressures or some streams specified here. And so at this point, we know the pressure here is about 216 PSIA. And the pressure here is about 20 PSIA, once we're getting down to 30. And so we like equal compression ratios in the two. Let me make sure I have pressure drop specified through these. I mean, back up, I need to specify some pressures in the compressors and I'm gonna assume about 75% polytropic efficiency in both compressors. So we're getting up to about 216 PSIA here. We're starting out around 20 PSIA on the low end. And so our intermediate pressure for our economizer needs to be a pressure that's gonna give us roughly equal compression ratios in our two compressors. So if we go from 20 up to about 80, that's a four to one compression ratio across this compressor. And then if we take that 80, multiply it by four, that'll get us about 320, that's a little bit too high. So let's see if we start down at 20 PSIA, we go up threefold, that'd be about 60 uh, PSIA coming out here. And then if we take that 60, multiply it by three, it gets us about 180, not quite there. So I'm going to set this intermediate pressure to be around 65, just a little bit above 60. So we'll set that pressure here to be 65 PSIA. And you can see once I do that, everything else in the loop turns maroon and the system is specified. So essentially what we've done, just going through those steps again, we had our chiller duty, 
Um, we set the composition here coming out of the, the propagation terminal. Uh, composition gets propagated or, or propagated around the loop, so we need to make sure it doesn't get propagated across the propagation terminal, so it's unchecked. We set the expansion valve outlet temperature to be five degrees less than the process outlet temperature. There's pressure drops specified, one PSI pressure drop specified in each one of these vessels. So obviously, you'd want to fine tune that with your own equipment data. We set the vapor fraction here coming out of the evaporator to be 100% vapor. We set the vapor fraction down here at the bottom to be 100% liquid or 0% vapor. And we also set the temperature coming out of the condenser to have a 10 degree approach to the temperature in the of the air coming into the air cooler. In the propagation terminal, set the temperature and vapor fraction to be the propagated variable. So those will be carried across the propagation terminal. That doesn't cause a conflict because otherwise we products wouldn't know what the temperature and pressure are here, our temperature and vapor fraction are here. So those two are propagated across the propagation terminal. Use the specifier to set stream seven equal to stream three. And then just made a guess for the intermediate pressure here on the economizer. So should have given that the name economizer. And with that, we can now execute the flow sheet and it should solve pretty readily. So, so for this setup, see we've got a total compressor power of 60, 4653. So we could experiment. Let's see what happens if we raise this intermediate pressure up to 70. Total compression power actually goes down a little bit, went down about third 27 horsepower. So not a big change, but at least it's something. But so it does indicate that there probably is an optimal economizer pressure and we're more than likely we're not quite there yet. And just a little thought on what's going on here. So we have a duty for that we've been that was specified for the process. And if I double click on stream five, it's got Regardless of that duty, it's going to have a certain mole fraction vapor. And so it's got a certain mole fraction liquid that corresponds to that. And so if we're, essentially all we're doing in this evaporator is boiling that liquid. And so what Permax is doing is determining the latent heat of that boiling liquid. And so that'll get you the BTUs per pound. We've got the BTUs per hour coming into the evaporator. And so from that, you can get the pounds per hour of refrigerant that needs to flow through the system. And so essentially by specifying the duty and specifying that we're essentially boiling all the liquid off in the evaporator, Promex is calculating the mass duty. And so that's how the overall refrigerant flow is determined here. That's a model. We've assumed some approach temperatures. So this might actually be a good model to take to a vendor and ask them to build you some equipment. But what happens if you already have some equipment and you'd like to see how it's going to perform under different ambient conditions? You've got this process already on hand. You've got data sheets for the exchangers. So we've got a data sheet for here for the chiller. We've got a data sheet for our air cooler. And we've got performance curves for our two compressors. And so if I look at, I've already put all that information into Promax. It's a little bit tedious to do it, it's not hard, but it just takes a little bit of time. So I'll spare you those details. But if I double click on the, on the evaporator, I've already got the rating information in there. This is an 80 inch shell kettle exchanger. So BKU type, uh, just one, one shell in, in parallel. So just one shell, the bundle diameter, and a 60 inch bundle, since it is a kettle, there's no baffles, I specified the number of tubes. You have 1,146 tubes. There are one, 
1.25, one and a quarter inch tubes with a 1.5 pitch on a, with a square pattern here. And so that information is already there. If I click solve, what Promax is telling me is this exchanger will actually do better than what we've specified here. So I mean, Promax is telling us that this exchanger, or we've specified that this exchanger is going to get down to minus 25 degrees. Since we have a fraction over design that's positive, it's actually going to happen, or what Promax is predicting is that this temperature would actually be lower in the real process. So we got the same kind of, we have similar rating information here in the air cooler. We look at it, go to the rating tab and click on the results. We've got a negative fraction over design. So our 10 degree approach that we specified here is not achievable under the current conditions. And so this 110 degrees we specified coming out here, uh, we can't get that cold. So coming in at 162 degrees, and we might only be able to get down to 105, 115 degrees. And we could sit here and play with the temperature and drive this to drive that fraction over design equal to down to zero. But we're going to set up some solvers to automatically handle that for us. And then also, if we look at the compressors, we've got the performance curves already put into the compressors. Uh, I've got them turned off uh, right now so that. So that we could just essentially force an efficiency in here. But when I turn these on, now Promax is going to calculate the efficiencies for us. And we'll also, for a given speed, will tell us how much given speed and throughput through the compressor will tell us how much pressure boost we got or we have or the, that the compressor can do. So let's step through changing this. And let's say we've got these exchange or these compressors operating at a fixed speed going to do is come in here and double click on the compressor and turn on all of the performance curves. The first step to do that, I'll first need to clear the efficiency out. So the efficiency will now be calculated from the performance curve. Okay, and let's say I want to operate at 7,000 RPM. So we're also going to need uh, to clear out this outlet pressure for now also, because the outlet pressure is going to be determined by the compressor speed. So for now, we'll just delete this calculator that's controlling this outlet pressure. And we're going to let the performance curves dictate the outlet pressure. So when I do that, I'll now be able to set the compressor speed at 7,000 RPM. So if we look at the plots, essentially we have the different performance curves plotted here. And essentially we're going to force Promax to operate on this performance curve. See, currently we're off the performance curve. It will we'll adjust that back down in a little bit. And then we can do the same thing over here for the, the high pressure compressor. We'll turn on it. Turn off its efficiency. And then go into the performance curves and turn all of those on. And then we'll work through, we'll set the speed in a little bit as we clear a few other variables. And I made a mistake earlier, this should be at 9,000 RPM on this compressor. If we look at the plot, it actually does put us on the performance curve here. So if I have these two compressors and they're operating at a fixed speed, the economizer intermediate pressure, the system is going to determine the economizer intermediate pressure. So what we want to do is instead of fixing this pressure here, essentially we want to adjust this pressure here in the model so that 
stream seven and stream three end up at the same pressure. No. So to do that, I will add a solver here on the economizer pressure to force P7 and P3 to match. No. So I'll right click here. This is in the economizer pressure or in stream two. I'll right click here and create a simple solver. This will be economizer P. And what I want to force is to have P7 and P3 be equal. And so to do that, simplest expression, just to say P7 minus P3. And then click add and I will define P7 and P3. So P3 is already open for us. So I'll just go ahead and define that and then click hold and then add. And then we can define P7 also. Click add, close. And I'm going to make an initial guess for this pressure, I think before we had 70, so we'll just stick with that. It's going to be adjusted based on the, essentially the, whatever pressure results from having the low pressure at 9,000 RPM and the high pressure compressor at 21,000 RPM. Okay, and back in that solver, just a few more steps. Right now, the, the default tolerances on this is going to be 0 0.001 PSIA. Probably don't need to be that tight of a tolerance. So I'm going to, to make it a looser tolerance, I'm going to make the weighting less than one. So make this weighting 0.1, and then if I do that, the tolerance on this becomes 0 0.01 PSIA. Still plenty tight. A few other steps. So this process outlet T right now is fixed at 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Essentially, we want to adjust this process outlet temperature until the fraction over design in this exchanger goes to zero. And essentially, that's Promax's prediction of the exchanger performance. So if I come in here, I'm going to create a solver on this process outlet temperature, create a simple solver. And this will be process outlet T. And then I just want to drive the fraction over design to zero. And so just the expression, just put FOD in the expression, and that'll drive the fraction over design to zero. Click add, and then the fraction over design I want to use, it's found in the blocks and the chiller tubes under Q manager, X rating results. Fraction over design. And that's FOD. So click add. I know 25 is too, too warm. Probably get down a little bit cooler. I'm going to say minus 27, a little bit better initial guess. I think I'd be happy with a fraction over design between probably 0.1% and negative 0.1%. That's probably plenty good. So to do that, I need to adjust my weighting to 0.01. The default tolerances on this is going to be 0 0.001 to 0, 0 to negative 0, 0, 001, which is a little tighter than I really need. So got that tolerance set. And then this one, this next solver specification is not the most obvious, but it seems to work. Uh, seems to work in this system. So this evaporator pressure, if we had let it float so that the, or essentially as this evaporator pressure changes, then the mass throughput through our high pressure compressor is going to change. So, so the, the throughput through the compressor for a fixed speed and outlet pressure is going to, if we lower the, Essentially, if we lower the pressure here in the evaporator, 
the mass throughput through this compressor will go down because the actual volume, the actual volume will go up, uh, which may, and so this compressor can really only handle a certain, a, a somewhat fixed actual volume flow. So if we drop the pressure, the actual mass flow that goes through the compressor goes down. So what we want to do is adjust this pressure until the speed in this compressor is at our target. And I inadvertently, I hadn't set the compressor rotation speed here. So what we're going to do is adjust this pressure until we reach our target, which is 21,000 RPM. And so we need to clear out this temperature because that's indirectly setting the evaporator pressure. And so either in stream five or stream six, I'm gonna set, create a solver here to adjust this pressure so that our speed in this high pressure compressor matches the 21,000 RPM. So I'm gonna create a simple solver here. And I'm, I have to admit this solver, this solver is not the most obvious of what they're doing, but it is really the only way I could figure out to determine how to set that or to hit the, the high pressure compressor speed target. And so this will be evaporator pressure. And I want the HP speed. I'm going to do this solver in a more rel in a relative fashion to sort of lower the tolerance. So I'm just going to write it as HP speed divided by 21,000. So essentially this when this solver expression goes to zero, the H, the high pressure compressor speed is going to be 21,000. So now I just need to find the HP speed. And properties and then compressor rotation speed. And since we have all of those different compressor curves defined, Promax is able to interpolate between them. And determine the uh, determine a, a pressure or a speed, but intermediate to any of the curves. So, so if we set a target of twenty thousand five hundred, for instance, it would be able to find that find their performance based on interpolating between our different curves. So I'm going to call this HP speed and click add. And so, car. Initial guess for the pressure, I'm going to say something like 20 PSIA here in this evaporator. It seems to be about at this range, might be a little higher, a little bit lower. Essentially, what we're going to be doing is adjusting this pressure. Once we do that, we'll be able to calculate the mass throughput through the evaporator, which will set the mass, indirectly set the mass throughput here in stream eight. That mass throughput is going to correspond to a certain to a certain volumetric throughput based on the pressure. We'll be able to determine the outlet pressure by our specifications here in the outlet of the condenser. And that will essentially help us pinpoint a, pot, a spot on these performance curves. And essentially each iteration with that evaporator pressure essentially will adjust until we hit this 21,000 RPM performance curve here in the middle. So at a, a any at a given evaporator pressure, we might be below that or above that, and from the solver will adjust the evaporator pressure until we end up here on this performance curve or on this created performance curve of twenty one thousand RPM. Okay, so the the outlet conditions of the compressor, the final pressure, is being determined by this evaporator temperature or condenser temperature here. Essentially, though, we saw that this condenser temperature was too low. We couldn't actually get down to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So we want to adjust this condenser temperature to derive the fraction over design in this exchanger to zero. So if I go in here to the condenser temperature. I'm going to create a solver here. Great simple solver. And this will be condenser outlet temperature. 
And for this one, I want to derive the fraction over design and the error curve to zero. So we'll just call it fraction over design again. I had a question from Alistair. Could you specify a second warmer chiller in place of the economizer to pre-cool the process stream? Uh, yes, you could. And essentially you just have to model, or what I'd recommend is just modeling and see if it helps or it hurts. So. And another question from Ijaz. Uh, can Promax about calculate the compressor RPM if the discharge, if the discharge pressure is specified and said? And the answer is yes. Essentially, that's what we're going to indirectly do. We're going to be adjusting this outlet temperature. And each time we do that, it's going to change the outlet pressure of this compressor, which will change, which will essentially move our operating point on our uh, performance map. And so it will, as the pressure goes up, we will essentially change our, we'll have to move to a higher and higher performance curve. So. So yes, the Promax will automatically adjust the compressor speed to match the inlet and outlet pressures and throughput that you specify. But we, I started to create a solver here on the condenser outlet temperature. And we're going to adjust that until we get a fraction over design of zero in, our, in the cooler, in the air chiller, our air cooler. So let me define the fraction over design in the condenser. It's found under Q manager, hex ratings, results, and then fraction over design. Click add. And I know the temperature is too low, so I'm going to set it a little bit higher to start with. And as before, I want to loosen the weighting on this solver and set it to 0.01. So let me, these solvers tend to not currently, we want to look at all of the solvers. Go to the solver summary down here on the left. It shows all of these solvers and they all have the same priority, um, which means they'll all, Promax will try to solve them all simultaneously. And so it essentially it will try to see the effect of manipulating this solver's variable on the error function for this solver down here. Um, sometimes that's the most efficient way to do it. In this one, this model, what I found is it's most efficient, or the, the best way to get this to solve robustly is to essentially make a step in the process outlet temperature and then hold it fixed, converge the model, see if we're at fraction over design equal to zero. If not, then we'll adjust the process outlet temperature and then reconverge all the other solvers. And then, so we want this solver to solve last. And so the way to do that, I go to the process outlet temperature, double click on that solver. If I check the skip dependency check button, Essentially, that's going to force everything else to, it'll essentially force this one to solve last, which seems to be the most efficient way to do it. So, no, essentially solve everything and then check to see if the FOD is right. If the FOD is too high, and that means we can actually get a little bit colder. So this temperature will go down, reconverge everything, and it'll keep going down until the FOD becomes negative and then it'll turn around and go the other way. So find it simplest if I just watch the solver summary while this is executing and execute it from here. What I'll see is I got an error message here. All right, this stream turned pink. So if I double click on the stream or double click on the compressor and go to the plots tab and see I'm off of the, essentially the flow rate's too high. I'm off of my 
9,000 RPM curve, which means my pressure here was probably too high. Or my initial guess for my pressure was probably too high, so or too low. So let's try this at a at a higher pressure so that the actual volumetric throw, throughput through the compressor is lower. So let's try executing this again. See, it goes around the loop. Go back to the solver summary. In the solver summary, you can see the solver errors are going down. It says 27 is not being manipulated, so it's converging for the first time for a process out of the temperature of minus 27. The errors are getting smaller over here. So once those converge, it will then start to adjust the process outlet temperature. And you can see it went from 20, minus 27 down to 28.725. I'm going to cheat and on the other screen, look at the other model <laughs> of the, the solve solution for this. Make sure I'm setting things similarly. Looks like I am. One thing we might consider also here is to set the step size for this solver. Sometimes this process out, the temperature can swing a little too wildly, wildly. Doesn't appear that it will this time though. Well, I think it actually is. See, it's sort of bouncing around between 25 and 28. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this solver and then come in here and set the step size where it only takes one degree Fahrenheit steps. And I think probably a better answer is to start at minus 27. So let's just do that and re-execute. But I have a, just to not waste your time and just to move on, this, this will eventually convert, converge with a, that one degree Fahrenheit step size, but I do already actually have the thing finished and converging here. So same model, same solvers have been set up and everything. So in this model, we've got just have some input boxes here so we can change our pressure targets, or I mean our speed targets. So we got 9,000 RPM here uh, and 21,000 RPM on the high pressure compressor. The air temperature, that might be one thing that'd be what originally got me interested in this is what is the effect of changing the air temperature? So let's say it's 100 degrees right now for the inlet air temperature, which solves out to about 115 degrees for the outlet temperature. So currently we're able to get down to 27 degrees or minus 27 degrees with 4,990 horsepower. So I'm going to take a screenshot of this with a snipping tool and save that, that over to the side. And let's just raise this inlet air temperature and see how much of an effect that has on the overall process condition. So I'm gonna change it, the inlet air temperature to be 105 degrees. And you can just re-execute the model now and see how much the power goes up. Once again, we'll look at the solver summary. So 
can see our, if we went up five degrees on our outlet air temperature, the total compressor power went from 4990 up to 5121 horsepower. And it doesn't look like our process temperature, it went up by about half a degree. So we're able to still do basically the same duty, but it did require, what is that, about 4% more horsepower? So I did the math right there. So with just a five degree increase in the outlet temperature. Uh, if we can come in here and look at the compressor performance curves, and you can see we are setting what appears, this is 20,000, this is 22,000, so this looks like it's probably right on the 21,000. Um, we can also look at the efficiency of the compressor at that point, We've got the efficiency curves plotted too. The exchanger ratings are both being driven to fraction over design of zero. So right now we have an exchanger, I go into the exchanger and go to the rating and then go to the sides on the exchanger. You can see I have a fouling resistance of zero specified for both sides. So the chiller tubes represents the air cooler or the air side of the exchanger. See the name up here. So let's say that we go from I'm going to make a snip of this one now and then make a change. We're going to say that we get some fouling on our air cooler tubes. Zoom out of this a little bit so I can capture everything. So that's the current conditions with 105 degrees. air temperature, but no fouling on the exchanger. So now if we come in here and we double click on the exchanger, and I'm going to set fouling of 0 0.005 for the air cooler side, or for the air side of the exchanger. Or, excuse me, I'm on the wrong exchanger here, y'all. Set that back to zero. I'm down here on the air cooler. So on the air side of the exchanger, go to the rating. I, had, I did have a fouling resistance, a 0.001 there. Let's see what the effect of going up to 0 0.005. And now we can re-execute this. So we were at minus or at 120 degrees Fahrenheit coming out of the condenser. And we get some dust on the fins. See how that affects our overall performance. Mariella has a question. Uh, temperature stream five would be the same as this temperature stream six if we didn't have a pressure drop here, but we've got a one PSI pressure drop. It looks like that ends up being about a two degree temperature difference going through the, so we're actually getting colder as we boil off the propane due to the lower pressure coming out. So before we had 120.58, we've just gone up to 120.78. So that fouling on the air fins maybe was obviously not enough to cause much of a difference. Total compressive power only went up five horsepower. So. It's going to take more significant fouling of the fins than that 0 0.005. Uh, maybe if I use 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 or something like that, you'd be a, see a more pronounced effect. You sit here and play with the different variables. We essentially back off, or we can increase the flow rate, or decrease the inlet temperature, or and then we could see the performance of this propane re refrigeration loop at different compressor speeds here. But let's say we would like to find the optimum operating conditions for this exchanger or for this propane refrigeration loop. 9,000 and 21,000 RPM are just essentially two numbers that I picked that are sort of in the middle of their performance curves. Uh, let's let Promax decide what the optimum pressure is or the optimum 
uh, speed of the two compressors are. Uh, obviously, that's going to change this intermediate pressure as that changes. Uh, did have a question from Mariella. Does Promax have a way to specify the pressure drop of a gearbox placed in between the compressors? There would be a way to specify a pressure drop. Probably you'd set up some sort of calculation in a with a specifier, maybe in a valve block that would represent essentially just a some way to represent the pressure drop in your system. We can figure out how to do it. It might not match what the equipment looks like in reality, but we have the same effect on the process though. So there is an optimum economizer pressure that is going to optimize the performance of this system. But that optimum that currently the economizer pressure is just dictated by the two fixed speeds of the two compressors. So what we're going to do is turn off those fixed speeds and let Promax or adjust the speeds to find the optimum, uh, the, to find the, essentially the minimum power requirement. And so what we're gonna do is say that we want to fix our process outlet temperature at minus 26 degrees. And so, so instead of this floating now to achieve a certain fraction over design, I'm just going to fix this temperature, which is going to fix the duty into the system. And then Promax will adjust the compressor speed uh, to find the optimum intermediate pressure between the two. And so I'm going to, just going to delete this calculator for now and just set this to be minus 26 degrees. So, which is going to essentially fix the duty coming into our system. So we currently have a solver on the condenser pressure. If you remember right, we were using that to adjust the speed of the, of the high pressure compressor. And we're gonna change that to, now we're going to manipulate this condenser pressure to drive the fraction over design in this exchanger to zero. So change the evaporator pressure so instead of targeting a certain speed, we're going to adjust the pressure until we get to 0% over design in this exchanger. So I'm going to delete these two variables. We're not going to use them. And then I'm going to click add and select blocks. And if you go to either the chiller tubes or the propane kettle, either one of them will get you to the same exchanger rating. So Q manager hex rating results and fraction over design. And click add. And we'll just leave the current pressure that's probably close to what we're eventually going to end up at. So these fraction over design before we had a 0.01 weighting to loosen the tolerance. I'm gonna to go ahead and set that. So we're adjusting the evaporator pressure here. Uh, we still have the condenser. We're still going to let it uh, adjust the condenser outlet temperature to drive its FOD to zero. We'll leave that solver there. And then now we're going to let have a solver on this economizer pressure. And essentially it's going to adjust to minimize this total compressor power. And so every time this pressure adjusts, it's going to cause the speed of the two compressors to adjust. And so first thing we need to do is clear out clear out this speed that we've set. We're going to let it float. And then we're going to force stream seven to match the pressure of stream three, because that's what it would do in reality. So essentially we adjust this pressure, it's going to, we'll adjust the outlet pressure coming out of this compressor to match it. So say P7 is going to equal P3. So I'll create a specifier here. Create a simple specifier. 
and this will be we'll guess the stream seven pressure or we'll say the stage we'll call low pressure outlet pressure and we'll say that it's equal to p7 click add to flow sheet p streams p7 phases total properties and then pressure p7 So now whenever this pressure changes, which will change string three's pressure, P7 will adjust to match it. And so with that, the compressor will then find the new speed that it requires to match that, that outlet pressure. And so over here in the economizer, we got the solver set up right now to make those two P3 and P7 match. We're going to change that so that we minimize the overall compressor power. So I've actually got the total compressor power created in a user, we'll just calculate it in the specifier itself. So I'm just going to say the power, the LP power, power plus the HP power, I want to I want to minimize that that sum, and so to do that, I'm going to check the is minimizer checkbox down at the bottom. I'm going to get rid of these. We're changing the solver to do something differently. So this now becomes a a minimizer. So it'll try to just minimize our expression here. So find LP power. It's in the Q streams under QLP energy rate. I'll define that as LP power. And then we'll click add. And then we'll do the same for the high pressure energy rate. So that'd be HP power. Click add. And so what we'd like to do is this, or what I found was the best way to get this to converge was to essentially make this minimizer solve less. So pick a pressure, converge the simulation, and, and then see if we've minimized the power. If not, pick a new pressure, converge the rest of the simulation. So essentially converge the other two solvers before you worry about converging this one. And so to do that, we're going to do once again, you can either set up, set up priorities. Uh, what I found is easier just to force it to solve last is to set this skip dependency check checkbox or turn it on. And then that will force the solver to solve last. And so with that, you can now just Tell Promax to execute the flow sheet. Let's see, where did we go wrong here? Oh, I selected the wrong variable here. It's supposed to be P3. So my apologies, y'all. So, so what we're doing, and this is in string P7, we're going to set it equal to P3. So Now I have a feeling it will solve a little better. See, it's going around, it's keeping this pressure fixed. It says the high pressure compressor is at 21,000 RPM. This is actually referencing a target that I created in a user value. I'll update it when it's done solving so that it actually shows the this compressor's power or this compressor speed. It's starting to adjust this pressure after solving, if we go to the solver summary. It's holding this pressure fixed until the other solvers converge. This is another one where we might want to step set the step size on the compressor power. I'm going to come in here and set the step size to be 
two PSI for this economizer pressure. And that seems to make it behave a little bit better. So it's settled on a pressure of 48.85, or not pressure, a total power of 48.85 with an economizer pressure of 102.83. I could, I could adjust this pressure up and down and we would see that whether you go up or down, the total power does go up. It's not terribly sensitive, but it, there, this does appear to be the optimum. Let me fix this call out real quick. So that it refers to the correct thing. So HP is equal to flux. Let's see. Let's the units. Play the units and show five figures. And so before we had 21,000 RPM and 9,000, it turned out that speeding up the low pressure compressor and slowing down the high pressure compressor, which has the effect of raising the intermediate pressure, ends up saving a little bit of power here. And if we wanted to show the effect of air fouling, so the like we did before, this is 4885 total power. I believe here in the model on the air side rating, I'm still using 0 0.005. If I lower this, essentially go back to a clean exchanger, let's see the effect on the total power. So it's 4885 here. Nice clean exchanger, save you 12 horsepower. <laughs> Nothing earth shattering. Uh, of course, that's fairly small amount of fouling on a on a air fin cooler. Actual fouling factors for probably higher than that. You get a little bit of dust. The fouling resistance is probably going to be more than that 0 0.005 that I had specified. But you could easily specify those in the model and see the effect on how it does. But um, you can see the Pressure's changed a little bit. Had to go, essentially, it, when we had some more fouling, the temperature went up, that final stage pressure went up, which boosted us up to a different performance curve. So we were at 1800 or 18,000 before, now we're up at 20,000. So the compressor's having to do a little bit more work, maybe move to a little bit more efficient spot on the compressor curve, I'm not terribly certain. But it did have an effect on the overall compressor speed or on the high pressure compressor speed if we were letting it float to try to find the optimum power. Just to, to wrap things up, modeling the refrigeration processes in Promax or once you sort of get the hang of it, it's really pretty straightforward. There's some things to keep in mind. It's the condenser outlet conditions are really what sets that final compressor discharge pressure. So temperature goes up or you have fouling in your condenser, that's gonna set make the final compressor discharge pressure go up, obviously. And the higher that goes, the harder that compressor has to work to pump the gas up to that pressure. Um, the evaporator outlet conditions set the first compressor's suction pressure. So essentially the pressure or the temperature that we need to get the evaporator down to to be able to exchange the heat is going to set the pressure going into the the low pressure side of your low pressure compressor or the suction side of your low pressure compressor. And so the further that suction is, pressure is away from the final discharge pressure, the higher your overall power requirement is going to be. Right, that's fairly obvious. And the refrigerant flow rate, it's essentially determined by the overall process duty and the inlet vapor fraction going into your evaporator. So Anything you can do to get more liquid going into the evaporator is likely going to reduce the overall refrigerant flow rate, which typically reduces the overall power. And 
using the economizer, essentially what it does is get you a, a larger vapor fraction going into your evaporator uh, for the same overall mass flow rate and also reduces the amount of gas that has to be boosted from the lowest pressure up to the highest pressure. And the benefit of the economizer becomes much more pronounced as you have a large spread between your condenser temperature and your evaporator temperature. So most, if talk, I started off talking about home air conditioning units. Most of those are a single, most of those don't include an economizer because you're Essentially, your condenser temperature might be 110 to 120 degrees. Your evaporators are around 45 degrees. Not a huge spread there. But you get these big propane refrigeration loops where the, the duty requirements are quite high. And sometimes you have 150 degree spread between the condenser and the evaporator. An economizer can really be beneficial there. And there, there is an optimal economizer pressure. If you have a fixed speed, fixed speed compressors, I mean, you're sort of stuck with what you get, but if you do have variable speed compressors, that does give you an opportunity to optimize your system. And Promax can help you help you find that point if you have all the compressor data sheets. Just some tips for modeling compression units. Typically, we just assume saturated conditions at the condenser and evaporator outlets. That's not always the case, and it doesn't. You don't have to specify the model the way we did here. There are ways to specify superheating and subcooling coming out of the out of the units, and so you will need to supply compressor efficiencies or have performance curves available. Typically, mentioned we have that propagation terminal, which is really just a purely a simulation tool. It is obviously not in the not a physical block that you would have in your process. Um, but typically, you place that downstream of the condenser, and then you propagate what is specified or either directly or manipulated by a solver on the condenser outlet. And the two are the cases we looked at today, it was the temperature and the vapor fraction, which was known coming out of the condenser. Uh, and typically there are two properties that are specified. Good practice just to put your refrigerant composition coming out of that propagation terminal, makes modeling easier, or it's just handy to always have it in the same place when you open up a model. So that seems to be a good place. And if you are using an economizer, you need to make sure that the first stage outlet pressure is equal to the economizer pressure. And you can either set that economizer pressure directly or manipulate it with a solver. So in cases we did today, we were manipulating it with a solver to achieve a goal, either for the fixed compressor speed, uh, we were adjusting the economizer pressure to get the first stage pressure to match the economizer pressure. Um, the, the second one, we were adjusting the economizer pressure to minimize the overall power requirements. I gave two examples of how to model these loops. They're just really what I came up with. There's probably other ways to do it. Once again, thank you for watching this webinar. And just remember that you can always uh, we are always here to answer your Promax questions as well as your process-related questions. Uh, that's, that's our job, and we love to do it. So thank you very much. Have a good day.